Introduction to Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Father Ziley of Detroit. Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume 1, by John Fox. Edited by William Byron Forbush. Introduction Sketch of the Author's Life John Fox, or F-O-X-E, was born at Boston, in Lincolnshire, in 1517, where his parents are stated to have lived in respectable circumstances. He was deprived of his father at an early age, and notwithstanding his mother soon married again, he still remained under the parental roof. From an early display of talents and inclination to learning, his friends were induced to send him to Oxford, in order to cultivate and bring them to maturity. During his residence at this place, he was distinguished for the excellence and acuteness of his intellect, which was improved by the emulation of his fellow collegians, united to an indefatigable zeal and industry on his part. These qualities soon gained him the admiration of all, and as a reward for his exertions and amiable conduct, he was chosen fellow of Magdalen College, which was accounted a great honor in the university, and seldom bestowed unless in cases of great distinction. It appears that the first display of his genius was in poetry, and that he composed some Latin comedies which are still extant, but he soon directed his thoughts to a more serious subject, the study of the sacred scriptures. To divinity, indeed, he implied himself with more fervency than circumspection, and discovered his partiality to the Reformation, which had then commenced, before he was known to its supporters, or to those who protected them, a circumstance which proved to him the source of his first troubles. He is said to have often affirmed that the first matter which occasioned his search into the popish doctrine was that he saw diverse things, most repugnant in their nature to one another, forced upon men at the same time. Upon this foundation his resolution and intended obedience to that church were somewhat shaken, and by degrees a dislike to the rest took place. His first care was to look into both the ancient and modern history of the Church, to ascertain its beginning and progress, to consider the causes of all those controversies which in the meantime had sprung up, and diligently to weigh their effects, solidity, infirmities, etc. Before he had attained his thirtieth year he had studied the Greek and Latin fathers, and other learned authors, the transactions of the councils and decrees of the consistories, and had acquired a very competent skill in the Hebrew language. In these occupations he frequently spent a considerable part, or even the whole, of the night, and in order to unbend his mind after such incessant study, he would resort to a grove near the college, a place much frequented by the students in the evening, on account of its sequestered gloominess. In these solitary walks he was often heard to ejaculate heavy sobs and sighs, and with tears to pour forth his prayers to God. These nightly retirements, in the sequel, gave rise to the first suspicion of his alienation from the Church of Rome. Being pressed for an explanation of this alteration in his conduct, he scorned to call in fiction to his excuse. He stated his opinions, and was by the sentence of the college, convicted, condemned as a heretic, and expelled. His friends, upon the report of this circumstance, were highly offended. When he was thus forsaken by his own friends, a refuge offered itself in the house of Sir Thomas Lucy, of Warwickshire, by whom he was sent for to instruct his children. The house is within easy walk of Stratford-on-Avon, and it was this estate which, a few years later, was the scene of Shakespeare's traditional boyish poaching expedition. Fox died when Shakespeare was three years old. 
In the Lucy house, Fox afterward married. But the fear of the popish inquisitors hastened his departure thence. As they were not contented to pursue public offences, but began also to dive into the secrets of private families. He now began to consider what was best to be done to free himself from further inconvenience, and resolved either to go to his wife's father or to his father-in-law. His wife's father was a citizen of Coventry, whose heart was not alienated from him, and he was more likely to be well entreated, or his daughter's sake. He resolved first to go to him, and in the meanwhile, by letters, to try whether his father-in-law would receive him or not. This he accordingly did, and he received for answer, quotes open, that it seemed to him a hard condition to take one into his house, whom he knew to be guilty and condemned for a capital offence, neither was he ignorant what hazard he should undergo in so doing. He would, however, show himself a kinsman, and neglect his own danger, if he would alter his mind, he might come, on condition to stay as long as he himself desired. But if he could not be persuaded to that, he must content himself with a shorter stay, and not bring him and his mother into danger. Quotes closed. No condition was to be refused. Besides, he was secretly advised by his mother to come, and not to fear his father-in-law's severity. Quotes open. For that, perchance, it was needful to write as he did, but when occasion should be offered, he would make recompense for his words with his actions. Quotes closed. In fact, he was better received by both of them than he had hoped for. By these means he kept himself concealed for some time, and afterwards made a journey to London, in the latter part of the reign of Henry the Eighth. Here, being unknown, he was in much distress and was even reduced to the danger of being starved to death, had not Providence interfered in his favor in the following manner. One day, as Mr. Fox was sitting in St. Paul's Church, exhausted with long fasting, a stranger took a seat by his side, and courteously saluted him, thrust a sum of money into his hand, and bade him cheer up his spirits. At the same time informing him, that in a few days new prospects would present themselves for his future subsistence. Who this stranger was he could never learn, but at the end of three days he received an invitation from the Duchess of Richmond to undertake the tuition of the children of the Earl of Surrey, who, together with his father, the Duke of Norfolk, was imprisoned in the tower by the jealousy and ingratitude of the king. The children thus confided to his care were Thomas, who succeeded to the dukedom, Henry, afterwards Earl of Northampton, and Jane, who became Countess of Westmoreland. In the performance of his duties he fully satisfied the expectations of the Duchess, their aunt. These halcyon days continued during the latter part of the reign of Henry the Eighth, and the five years of the reign of Edward the Sixth until Mary came to the crown, who, soon after her accession, gave all power into the hands of the papists. At this time Mr. Fox, who was still under the protection of his noble pupil, the Duke, began to excite the envy and hatred of many, particularly Dr. Gardiner, then Bishop of Winchester, who in the sequel became his most violent enemy. Mr. Fox, aware of this, and seeing the dreadful persecutions then commencing, began to think of quitting the kingdom. As soon as the duke knew his intention, he endeavored to persuade him to remain, and his arguments were so powerful, and given with so much sincerity, that he gave up the thought of abandoning his asylum for the present. At that time the Bishop of Winchester was very intimate with the duke, by the patronage of whose family he had risen to the dignity he then enjoyed, and frequently waited on him to present his service, when he several times requested that he might see his old tutor. At first the duke denied his request, at one time alleging his absence, at another indisposition. At length it happened that Mr. Fox, not knowing the bishop was in the house, entered the room where the duke and he were in discourse, and seeing the bishop, withdrew. 
Gardiner asked who that was. The duke answered that he was his physician, who was somewhat uncourtly, as being new come from the university. "'I like his countenance and aspect very well,' replied the bishop, "'and when occasion offers I will send for him.' The duke understood that speech as the messenger of some approaching danger, and now himself thought it high time for Mr. Fox to quit the city and even the country. He accordingly caused everything necessary for his flight to be provided in silence, by sending one of his servants to Ipswich to hire a bark and prepare all the requisites for his departure. He also fixed on the house of one of his servants, who was a farmer, where he might lodge until the wind became favorable, and everything being in readiness, Mr. Fox took leave of his noble patron, and with his wife, who was pregnant at the time, secretly departed for the ship. The vessel was scarcely under sail, when a most violent storm came on, which lasted all day and night, and the next day drove them back to the port from which they had departed. During the time that the vessel had been at sea, an officer dispatched by the Bishop of Winchester had broken open the house of the farmer, with a warrant to apprehend Mr. Fox wherever he might be found, and bring him back to the city. On hearing this news he hired a horse, under the pretense of leaving the town immediately, but secretly returned the same night, and agreed with the captain of the vessel to sail for any place as soon as the wind should shift, only desired him to proceed and not to doubt that God would prosper his undertaking. The mariner suffered himself to be persuaded, and within two days landed his passengers in safety at Newport. After spending a few days in that place, Mr. Fox set out for Basel, where he found a number of English refugees who had quitted their country to avoid the cruelty of the persecutors. With these he associated, and began to write his History of the Acts and Monuments of the Church, which was first published in Latin at Basel in 1554, and in English in 1563. In the meantime, the Reformed religion began again to flourish in England, and the Popish faction much to decline by the death of Queen Mary, which induced the greater number of the Protestant exiles to return to their native country. Among others, on the accession of Elizabeth to the throne, Mr. Fox returned to England, where, on his arrival, he found a faithful and active friend in his late pupil, the Duke of Norfolk, until death deprived him of his benefactor, after which event Mr. Fox inherited a pension bequeathed to him by the Duke, and ratified by his son, the Earl of Suffolk. Nor did the good man's successes stop here. On being recommended to the Queen by her Secretary of State, the great Cecil, Her Majesty granted him the prebendary of Shipton, in the Cathedral of Salisbury, which was in a manner forced upon him for it was with difficulty that he could be persuaded to accept it. On his resettlement in England, he employed himself in revising and enlarging his admirable martyrology. With prodigious pains and constant study, he completed that celebrated work in eleven years. For the sake of greater correctness, he wrote every line of this vast book with his own hand, and transcribed all the records and papers himself. But in consequence of such excessive toil, leaving no part of his time free from study, nor affording himself either the repose or recreation which nature required, his health was so reduced, and his person became so emaciated and altered, that such of his friends and relations as only conversed with him occasionally could scarcely recognize his person. Yet, though he grew daily more exhausted, he proceeded in his studies as briskly as ever, nor would he be persuaded to diminish his accustomed labors. The papists, foreseeing how detrimental his history of their errors and cruelties would prove to their cause, had recourse to every artifice to lessen the reputation of his work. But their malice was of signal service, both to Mr. Fox himself and to the Church of God at large, as it eventually made his book more intrinsically valuable, by inducing him to weigh with the most scrupulous attention 
the certainty of the facts which he recorded, and the validity of the authorities from which he drew his information. But while he was thus indefatigably employed in promoting the cause of truth, he did not neglect the other duties of his station. He was charitable, humane, and attentive to the wants, both spiritual and temporal, of his neighbors. With the view of being more extensively useful, although he had no desire to cultivate the acquaintance of the rich and great on his own account, he did not decline the friendship of those in a higher rank who proffered it, and never failed to employ his influence with them in behalf of the poor and needy. In consequence of his well-known probity and charity, he was frequently presented with sums of money by persons possessed of wealth, which he accepted and distributed among those who were distressed. He would also occasionally attend the table of his friends, not so much for the sake of pleasure as from civility, and to convince them that his absence was not occasioned by a fear of being exposed to the temptations of the appetite. In short, his character as a man and as a Christian was without reproach. Although the recent recollection of the persecutions under Bloody Mary gave bitterness to his pen, it is singular to note that he was personally the most conciliatory of men, and that while he heartily disowned the Roman church in which he was born, he was one of the first to attempt the concord of the Protestant brethren. In fact, he was a veritable apostle of toleration. When the plague or pestilence broke out in England in 1563, and many forsook their duties, Fox remained at his post, assisting the friendless and acting as the almsgiver of the rich. It was said of him that he could never refuse help to any one who asked it in the name of Christ. Tolerant and large-hearted, he exerted his influence with Queen Elizabeth to confirm her intention to no longer keep up the cruel practice of putting to death those of opposing religious convictions. The Queen held him in respect, and referred to him as, quotes open, our father Fox, quotes closed. Mr. Fox had joy in the fruits of his work while he was yet alive. It passed through four large editions before his decease, and it was ordered by the bishops to be placed in every cathedral church in England, where it was often found chained, as the Bible was in those days, to a lectern for the access of the people. At length, having long served both the church and the world by his ministry, by his pen, and by the unsullied luster of a benevolent, useful, and holy life, he meekly resigned his soul to Christ on the 18th of April, 1587, being then in the seventieth year of his age. He was interred in the chancel of St. Giles, Cripplegate, of which parish he had been, in the beginning of Elizabeth's reign, for some time vicar. End of Introduction Recording by Father Ziley, Detroit, Michigan D-R-Z-E-I-L-E -E dot net Red March 2009Chapter 1 of Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume 1, by John Fox, edited by William Byron Forbush. Chapter 1. History of Christian Martyrs to the First General Persecutions under Nero. Christ, our Saviour, in the Gospel of St. Matthew, hearing the confession of Simon Peter, who first of all other openly acknowledged him to be the Son of God, and perceiving the secret hand of his father therein, called him, alluding to his name, a rock, upon which rock he would build, his church so strong that the gates of hell should not prevail against it. In which words three things are to be noted. First, that Christ will have a church in this world. Secondly, that the same church should mightily be impugned, not only by the world, 
but also by the uttermost strength and powers of all hell. And thirdly, that the same church, notwithstanding the uttermost of the devil and all his malice, should continue. Which prophecy of Christ we see wonderfully to be verified, in so much that the whole course of the church to this day may seem nothing else but a verifying of the said prophecy. First, that Christ has set up a church, needeth no declaration. Secondly, what force of princes, kings, monarchs, governors, and rulers of this world, with their subjects, publicly and privately, with all their strength and cunning, have bent themselves against this church? And thirdly, how the said church, all this notwithstanding, has yet endured and holden its own? What storms and tempests it has overpassed, wondrous it is to behold. For the more evident declaration whereof, I have addressed this present history, to the end first, that the wonderful works of God in his church might appear to his glory, also that the continuance and proceedings of the church, from time to time, being set forth, more knowledge and experience may rebound thereby, to the profit of the reader and edification of Christian faith. As it is not our business to enlarge upon our Saviour's history, either before or after his crucifixion, we shall only find it necessary to remind our readers of the discomfiture of the Jews by his subsequent resurrection. Although one apostle had betrayed him, although another had denied him, under the solemn sanction of an oath, and although the rest had forsaken him, unless we may accept the disciple who was known unto the high priest. The history of his resurrection gave a new direction to all their hearts, and after the mission of the Holy Spirit, imparted new confidence to their minds. The powers with which they were endued emboldened them to proclaim his name, to the confusion of the Jewish rulers and the astonishment of Gentile proselytes. First, St. Stephen. St. Stephen suffered the next in order. His death was occasioned by the faithful manner in which he preached the gospel to the betrayers and murderers of Christ. To such a degree of madness were they excited, that they cast him out of the city and stoned him to death. The time when he suffered is generally supposed to have been at the Passover, which succeeded to that of our Lord's crucifixion, and to the era of his ascension in the following spring. Upon this a great persecution was raised against all, who professed their belief in Christ as the Messiah or as a prophet. We are immediately told by St. Luke that there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem, and that they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. About two thousand Christians, with Nicanor, one of the seven diacons, suffered martyrdom during the persecution that arose about Stephen. Second, James the Great. The next martyr we meet with, according to St. Luke, in the history of the Apostles' Acts, was James, the son of Zebedee, the elder brother of John, and a relative of our Lord. For his mother Salome was cousin German to the Virgin Mary. It was not until ten years after the death of Stephen that the second martyrdom took place. For no sooner had Herod Agrippa been appointed governor of Judea, than, with a view to ingratiate himself with them, he raised a sharp persecution against the Christians, and determined to make an effectual blow by striking at their leaders. The account given us by an eminent primitive writer, Clemens Alexandrinus, ought not to be overlooked, that, as James was led to the place of martyrdom, his accuser was brought to repent of his conduct, by the apostle's extraordinary courage and undauntedness, and fell down at his feet to request his pardon, professing himself a Christian, and resolving that James should not receive the crown of martyrdom alone. Hence they were both beheaded at the same time. Thus did the first apostolic martyr cheerfully and resolutely receive that cup, which he had told our Saviour he was ready to drink. Timon and Parmenas suffered martyrdom about the same time, the one at Philippi and the other in Macedonia. These events took place A.D. 44. 
3. Philip Was born at Bethsaida in Galilee, and was first called by the name of Disciple. He labored diligently in Upper Asia, and suffered martyrdom at Heliopolis in Phrygia. He was scourged, thrown into prison, and afterwards crucified. Anno Domini 54 4. Matthew Whose occupation was that of toll-gatherer, was born at Nazareth. He wrote his gospel in Hebrew, which was afterwards translated into Greek by James the Less. The scene of his labors was Parthia and Ethiopia, in which latter country he suffered martyrdom, being slain with a halberd in the city of Nadabach, and on Dominic 60. 5. James the Less is supposed by some to have been the brother of our Lord, by a former wife of Joseph. This is very doubtful, and accords too much with the Catholic superstition that Mary never had any other children except our Saviour. He was elected to the oversight of the churches of Jerusalem, and was the author of the epistle ascribed to James in the sacred canon. At the age of ninety-four he was beat and stoned by the Jews, and finally had his brains dashed out with a fuller's club. 6. Matthias, of whom less is known than of most of the other disciples, was elected to fill the vacant place of Judas. He was stoned at Jerusalem, and then beheaded. 7. Andrew, was the brother of Peter. He preached the gospel to many Asiatic nations, but on his arrival at Edessa, he was taken and crucified on a cross, the two ends of which were fixed transversely in the ground. Hence the derivation of the term, St. Andrew's Cross. 8. St. Mark Was born of Jewish parents of the tribe of Levi. He is supposed to have been converted to Christianity by Peter, whom he served as an amanuensis, and under whose inspection he wrote his gospel in the Greek language. Mark was dragged to pieces by the people of Alexandria, at the great solemnity of Serapis, their idol, ending his life under their merciless hands. 9. Peter Among many other saints, the blessed Apostle Peter was condemned to death and crucified, as some do write, at Rome, albeit some others, and not without cause, do doubt thereof. Hegesippus saith, that Nero sought matter against Peter to put him to death, which, when the people perceived, they entreated Peter with much ado that he would fly the city. Peter, through their importunity at length persuaded, prepared himself to avoid. But coming to the gate, he saw the Lord Christ come to meet him, to whom he, worshipping, said, Lord, whither dost thou go? To whom he answered and said, I am come again to be crucified. By this, Peter, perceiving his suffering to be understood, returned into the city. Jerome says that he was crucified, his head being down and his feet upward, himself so requiring, because he was, he said, unworthy to be crucified, after the same form and manner as the Lord was. 10. Paul Paul the apostle, who before was called Saul, after his great travail and unspeakable labors in promoting the gospel of Christ, suffered also in this first persecution under Nero. Abdias declares that under his execution Nero sent two of his esquires, Ferega and Parsimius, to bring him word of his death. They, coming to Paul instructing the people, desired him to pray for them, that they might believe, who told them that shortly after they should believe, and be baptized at his sepulchre. This done, the soldiers came and led him out of the city to the place of execution, where he, after his prayers made, gave his neck to the sword. 11. Jude The brother of James was commonly called Thaddeus. He was crucified at Edessa, Anno Domini 72. 12. Bartholomew preached in several countries, and having translated the Gospel of Matthew into the language of India, he propagated it in that country. He was at length cruelly beaten, and then crucified by the impatient idolaters. 13. Thomas, called Didymus, preached the Gospel in Parthia and India, where exciting the rage of the pagan priests, 
he was murdered by being thrust through with a spear. 14. Luke, the evangelist, was the author of the gospel which goes under his name. He travelled with Paul through various countries, and is supposed to have been hanged on an olive tree by the idolatrous priests of Greece. 15. Simon, surnamed Zelotes, preached the gospel in Mauritania, Africa, and even in Britain, in which latter country he was crucified, Anno Domini, 74. 16. John. The beloved disciple was brother to James the Great. The churches of Smyrna, Pergamos, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, and Thyatira were founded by him. From Ephesus he was ordered to be sent to Rome, where it is affirmed he was cast into a cauldron of boiling oil. He escaped by miracle without injury. Domitian afterwards banished him to the Isle of Patmos, where he wrote the book of Revelation. Nerva, the successor of Domitian, recalled him. He was the only apostle who escaped a violent death. 17. Barnabas Was of Kepros, but of Jewish descent. His death is supposed to have taken place about Anno Domini 73. And yet, notwithstanding all these continual persecutions and horrible punishments, the church daily increased, deeply rooted in the doctrine of the apostles and of men apostolical, and watered plenteously with the blood of saints. End of chapter 1「Chapter Two, Part One of Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume One by John Fox. Edited by William Byron Forbush. Chapter Two, The Ten Primitive Persecutions, Part One. The first persecution under Nero, Anno Domini 67. The first persecution of the Church took place in the year 67 under Nero, the sixth emperor of Rome. This monarch reigned for the space of five years, with terrible credit to himself, but then gave way to the greatest extravagancy of temper and to the most atrocious barbarities. Among other diabolical whims, he ordered that the city of Rome should be set on fire, which order was executed by his officers, guards, and servants. While the imperial city was in flames, he went up to the tower of Massaneus, played upon his harp, sung the song of the burning of Troy, and openly declared that he wished the ruin of all things before his death. Besides the noble pile, called the circus, many other palaces and houses were consumed, Several thousands perished in the flames, were smothered in the smoke, or buried beneath the ruins. The dreadful conflagration continued nine days, when Nero, finding that his conduct was greatly blamed, and the severe odium cast upon him, determined to lay the whole upon the Christians, at once to excuse himself, and have an opportunity of glutting his sight with new cruelties. This was the occasion of the first persecution, and the barbarities exercised on the Christians were such as even excited the commiseration of the Romans themselves. Nero even refined upon cruelty, and contrived all manner of punishments for the Christians that the most infernal imagination could design. In particular, he had some sewed up in skins of wild beasts, and then worried by dogs until they expired, and others dressed in shirts made stiff by wax, fixed to axle trees, and set on fire in his gardens, in order to illuminate them. This persecution was general throughout the whole Roman Empire, but it rather increased than diminished the spirit of Christianity. In the course of it, St. Paul and St. Peter were martyred. To their names may be added Erastus, Chamberlain of Corinth, Aristarchus the Macedonian, and Trophimus and Ephesians, converted by St. Paul, and fellow-laborer with him, Joseph, commonly called Barsabbas, 
and Ananias, bishop of Damascus, each of the seventy. The second persecution, under Domitian, Anno Domini, eighty-one. The emperor Domitian, who was naturally inclined to cruelty, who was naturally inclined to cruelty, first slew his brother, and then raised the second persecution against the Christians. In his rage he put to death some of the Roman senators, some through malice, and others to confiscate their estates. He then commanded all the lineage of David to be put to death. Among the numerous martyrs that suffered during this persecution was Simeon, bishop of Jerusalem, who was crucified, and St. John, who was boiled in oil, and afterwards banished to Patmos. Flavia, the daughter of a Roman senator, was likewise banished to Pontus, and a law was made, that no Christian, once brought before the tribunal, should be exempted from punishment without renouncing his religion. A variety of fabricated tales were, during this reign, composed in order to injure the Christians. Such was the infatuation of the pagans, that, if famine, pestilence, or earthquakes afflicted any of the Roman provinces, it was laid upon the Christians. These persecutions among the Christians increased the number of informers, and many, for the sake of gain, swore away the lives of the innocent. Another hardship was, that, when any Christians were brought before the magistrates, a test oath was proposed, when if they refused to take it, death was pronounced against them, and if they confessed themselves Christians, the sentence was the same. The following were the most remarkable among the numerous martyrs who suffered during this persecution. Dionysius, the Areopagite, was an Athenian by birth, and educated on all the useful and ornamental literature of Greece. He then travelled to Egypt to study astronomy, and made very particular observations on the great and supernatural eclipse which happened at the time of our Saviour's crucifixion. The sanctity of his conversation, and the purity of his manners, recommended him so strongly to the Christians in general, that he was appointed Bishop of Athens. Nicodemus, a benevolent Christian of some distinction, suffered at Rome during the rage of Domitian's persecution. Protasius and Gervasius were martyred at Milan. Timothy was the celebrated disciple of St. Paul and Bishop of Ephesus, where he zealously governed the church until Anno Domini 97. At this period, as the pagans were about to celebrate a feast called Catagogion, Timothy, meeting the procession, severely reproved them for their ridiculous idolatry, which so exasperated the people that they fell upon him with their clubs, and beat him in so dreadful a manner that he expired of the bruises two days later. The Third Persecution Under Trajan, Anno Domini, 108 In the Third Persecution, Pliny II, a man learned and famous, seeing the lamentable slaughter of Christians, and moved therewith to pity, brought to Trajan, certifying him that there were many thousands of them daily put to death, of which none did anything contrary to the Roman laws worthy of persecution. The whole account they gave of their crime, or error, whichever it is to be called, amounted only to this, viz., that they were accustomed on a stated day to meet before daylight, and to repeat together a set form of prayer to Christ as a God, and to bind themselves by an obligation, not indeed to commit wickedness, but on the contrary, never to commit theft, robbery, or adultery, never to falsify their word, never to defraud any man, after which it was their custom to separate, and reassemble to partake in common of a harmless meal. In this persecution suffered the blessed martyr Ignatius, who is held in famous reverence among very many. This Ignatius was appointed to the bishopric of Antioch, next after Peter in succession. Some do say that he, being sent from Syria to Rome, because he professed Christ, was given to the wild beasts to be devoured. It's also said of him, that when he passed through Asia, being under the most strict custody of his keepers, he strengthened and confirmed the churches, through all the cities as he went, both with his exhortations, 
and preaching of the word of God. Accordingly, having come to Smyrna, he wrote to the church at Rome, exhorting them not to use means for his deliverance from martyrdom, lest they should deprive him of that which he most longed and hoped for. Now I begin to be a disciple. I care for nothing of visible or invisible things, so that I may but win Christ. Let fire and the cross, let the companies of wild beasts, let breaking of bones and tearing of limbs, let the grinding of the whole body and all the malice of the devil come upon me. Be it so, only may I win Christ Jesus. And even when he was sentenced to be thrown to the beasts, such as the burning desire that he had to suffer, that he spake, what time he heard the lions roaring, saying, I am the wheat of Christ, I am going to be ground with the teeth of wild beasts, that I may be found pure bread. Trajan being succeeded by Adrian, the latter continued the third persecution with as much severity as his predecessor. About this time Alexander, bishop of Rome, with his two deacons, were martyred, as were Quirinus and Hernes, with their families. Zenon, a Roman nobleman, and about ten thousand other Christians. In Mount Ararat many were crucified, crowned with thorns, and spears run into their sides, in imitation of Christ's passion. Ostachius, a brave and successful Roman commander, was by the emperor ordered to join in an idolatrous sacrifice, to celebrate some of his own victories. But his faith, being a Christian in his heart, was so much greater than his vanity, that he nobly refused it. Enraged at the denial, the ungrateful emperor forgot the service of this skilful commander, and ordered him and his whole family to be martyred. At the martyrdom of Faustinus and Jovita, brothers and citizens of Brescia, their torments were so many, and their patience so great, that Calocarius, a pagan, beholding them, was struck with admiration, and exclaimed in a kind of ecstasy, Great is the God of the Christians, for which he was apprehended, and suffered a similar fate. Many other similar cruelties and rigors were exercised against the Christians, until Quadratus, bishop of Athens, made a learned apology in their favor before the emperor, who happened to be there, and Aristides, a philosopher of the same city, wrote an elegant epistle, which caused Adrian to relax in his severities, and relent in their favor. Adrian dying anno domini 138, was succeeded by Antonius Pius, one of the most amiable monarchs that ever reigned, and who stayed the persecutions against the Christians. The fourth persecution, under Marcus Aurelius Antonius, anno domini 162. Marcus Aurelius followed about the year of our Lord 161, a man of nature more stern and severe, and although in study of philosophy and in civil government no less commendable, yet, toward the Christians sharp and fierce, by whom was moved the fourth persecution. The cruelties used in this persecution were such that many of the spectators shuddered with horror at the sight, and were astonished at the intrepidity of the sufferers. Some of the martyrs were obliged to pass, with their already wounded feet, over thorns, nails, sharp shells, etc., upon their points. Others were scourged until their sinews and veins lay bare, and after suffering the most excruciating tortures that could be devised, they were destroyed by the most terrible death. Germanicus, a young man, but a true Christian, being delivered to the wild beasts on account of his faith, behaved with such astonishing courage that several pagans became converts to a faith which inspired such fortitude. Polycarp, the venerable bishop of Smyrna, hearing that persons were seeking for him, escaped, but was discovered by a child. After feasting the guards who apprehended him, he desired an hour in prayer, which being allowed, he prayed with such fervency that his guards repented, that they had been instrumental in taking him. He was, however, carried before the proconsul, condemned, and burnt in the marketplace. The proconsul then urged him, saying, Swear, and I will release thee, reproach Christ. 
Polycarp answered, Eighty and six years have I served him, and he never once wronged me. How then shall I blaspheme my king, who has saved me? At the stake to which he was only tied, but not nailed as usual, as he assured them he should stand immovable, the flames and their kindling the faggots encircled his body like an arch without touching him, and the executioner, on seeing this, was ordered to pierce him with a sword, when so great a quantity of blood flowed out as extinguished the fire. But his body, at the instigation of the enemies of the gospel, especially Jews, was ordered to be consumed in the pile, and the request of his friends, who wished to give it Christian burial, rejected. They nevertheless collected his bones, and as much of his remains as possible, and caused them to be decently interred. Metrodorus, a minister, who preached boldly, and Pionius, who made some excellent apologies for the Christian faith, were likewise burnt. Carpus and Papillus, two worthy Christians, and Agatonica, a pious woman, suffered martyrdom at Pergamopolis in Asia. Felicitatis, an illustrious Roman lady, of a considerable family and the most shining virtues, was a devout Christian. She had seven sons, whom she had educated with the most exemplary piety. Januarius, the eldest, was scourged and pressed to death with weights. Felix and Philip, the two next, had their brains dashed out with clubs. Silvanus, the fourth, was murdered by being thrown from a precipice and the three younger sons, Alexander, Vitalis, and Marshall, were beheaded. The mother was beheaded with the same sword as the three latter. Justin, the celebrated philosopher, fell a martyr to his persecution. He was a native of Neapolis in Samaria, and was born Anno Domini 103. Justin was a great lover of truth, and a universal scholar. He investigated the Stoic and Peripatetic philosophy, and attempted the Pythagorean. But the behavior of our, of its professors, disgusting him. He applied himself to the Platonic, in which he took great delight. About the year 133, when he was thirty years of age, he became a convert to Christianity, and then, for the first time, perceived the real nature of truth. He wrote an elegant epistle to the Gentiles, and employed his talents in convincing the Jews of the truth of the Christian rites, spending a great deal of time in travelling, until he took up his abode in Rome, and fixed his habitation upon the Viminal Mount. He kept a public school, taught many who afterward became great men, and wrote a treatise to confuse heresies of all kinds. As the pagans began to treat the Christians with great severity, Justin wrote his first apology in their favour. This piece displays great learning and genius, and occasions the emperor to publish an edict in favor of the Christians. Soon after, he entered into frequent contests with Crescens, a person of a vicious life and conversation, but a celebrated cynic philosopher, and his arguments appeared so powerful, yet disgusting to the cynic, that he resolved on, and in the sequel accomplished, his destruction. The second apology of Justin, upon certain severities, gave Crescens the cynic an opportunity to prejudicing the emperor against the writer of it, upon which Justin and six of his companions were apprehended. Being commanded to sacrifice to the pagan idols, they refused, and were condemned to be scourged, and then beheaded, which sentence was executed with all imaginable severity. Several were beheaded for refusing to sacrifice to the image of Jupiter, in particular Concordus, a diacon of the city of Spoleto. Some of the restless northern nations having risen in arms against Rome, the emperor marched to encounter them. He was, however, drawn into an ambuscade, and dreaded the loss of his whole army. Enveloped with mountains, surrounded by enemies, and perishing with thirst, the pagan deities were invoked in vain when the men belonging to the Militin, or Thundering Legion, who were all Christians, were commanded to call upon their god for succor. A miraculous deliverance immediately ensued. A prodigious quantity of rain fell, which, being caught by the men and filling their dikes, afforded a sudden and astonishing relief. 
It appears that the storm, which miraculously flashed in the face of the enemy, so intimidated them, that part deserted to the Roman army, the rest were defeated, and the revolted provinces entirely recovered. This affair occasioned the persecution to subside for some time, at least in those parts immediately under the inspection of the emperor, but we find that it soon after raged in France, particularly at Lyons, where the tortures to which many of the Christians were put almost exceed the powers of description. The principal of these martyrs were Vettius Agatus, a young man, Blandina, a Christian lady, of a weak constitution, Sanctus, a diacon of Vienna, red-hot plates of brass were placed upon the tenderest parts of his body, Biblius, a weak woman, once an apostate, Attalus of Pergamus, and Pothinus, the venerable bishop of Lyons, who was ninety years of age. Blandina, on the day when she and the three other champions were first brought into the amphitheatre, she was suspended on a piece of wood fixed in the ground, and exposed as food for the wild beasts, at which time, by her earnest prayers, she encouraged others. But none of the wild beasts would touch her, so that she was remanded to prison. When she was again produced for the third and last time, she was accompanied by Ponticus, a youth of fifteen, and the constancy of their face so enraged the multitude that neither the sex of the one nor the youth of the other were respected, being exposed to all manner of punishments and tortures. Being strengthened by a blandina, he persevered unto death, and she, after enduring all the torments heretofore mentioned, was at length slain with the sword. When the Christians, upon these occasions, received martyrdom, they were ornamented, and crowned with garlands of flowers, for which they, in heaven, received eternal crowns of glory. It has been said that the lives of the early Christians consisted of persecution above ground and prayer below ground. Their lives are expressed by the Colosseum and the Catacombs. Beneath Rome are the excavations, which we call the Catacombs, which were at once temples and tombs, the early church of Rome might well be called the church of the catacombs. There are some sixty catacombs near Rome, on which some six hundred miles of galleries have been traced, and these are not all. These galleries are about eight feet high and from three to five feet wide, containing on either side several rows of long, low, horizontal recesses, one above another like berths in a ship. In these the dead bodies were placed, and the front closed, either by a single marble slab, or several great tiles laid in mortar. On these slabs or tiles, epitaphs or symbols are graved or, or painted. Both pagans and Christians buried their dead in these catacombs. When the Christian graves have been opened, the skeletons tell their own terrible tale. Heads are found severed from the body, ribs and shoulder blades are broken, bones and offer calcined from fire. But despite the awful story of persecution that we may read here, the inscriptions breathe forth peace and joy and triumph. Here are a few. Here lies Marcia, put to rest in a dream of peace. Lawrence to his sweetest son, born away of angels. Victorious in peace and in Christ. Being called away, he went in peace. Remember, when reading these inscriptions, the story, the skeletons tell of persecution, of torture, and of fire. But the full force of these epitaphs is seen when we contrast them with the pagan epitaphs, such as, Live for the present hour, since we are sure of nothing else. I lift my hands against the gods who took me away, at the age of twenty, though I had done no harm. Once I was not, now I am not. I know nothing about it, and it is no concern of mine. Traveller, curse me not as you pass, for I am in darkness and cannot answer. The most frequent Christian symbols on the walls of the catacombs are the good shepherd with a lamp on his shoulder, a ship under full sail, harps, anchors, crowns, wines, and above all, the fish. End of chapter 2, part 1
Chapter Two, Part Two of Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume One by John Fox, edited by William Byron Forbush. Chapter Two, The Ten Primitive Persecutions, Part Two. The fifth persecution commencing with Severus, Anno Domini 192. Severus, having been recovered from a severe fit of sickness by a Christian, became a great favorer of the Christians in general. But the prejudice and fury of the ignorant multitude prevailing, obsolete laws were put in execution against the Christians. The progress of Christianity alarmed the pagans, and they revived the stale calumny of placing accidental misfortunes to the account of its professors, Anno Domini 192. But though persecuting malice raged, yet the gospel shone with resplendent brightness, and firm as an impregnable rock, withstood the attacks of its boisterous enemies with success. Tertullian, who lived in this age, informs us, that if the Christians had collectively withdrawn themselves from the Roman territories, the empire would have been greatly depopulated. Victor, bishop of Rome, suffered martyrdom in the first year of the third century, Anno Domini 201. Leonidas, the father of the celebrated Oregon, was beheaded for being a Christian. Many of Origen's hearers likewise suffered martyrdom, particularly two brothers named Plutarchus and Serenus, Another Serenus, Heron, and Heraclides were beheaded. Rais had boiled pitch poured upon her head, and was then burned, as was Marcella her mother. Botaneia, the sister of Rais, was executed in the same manner as Rais had been. But Basilides, an officer belonging to the army, and ordered to attend her execution, became her convert. Basilides being, as an officer, required to take a certain oath, refused, saying that he could not swear by the Roman idols, as he was a Christian. Struck with surprise, the people could not, at first, believe what they heard, but he had no sooner confirmed the same than he was dragged before the judge, committed to prison, and speedily afterward beheaded. Irenaeus, bishop of Lyons, was born in Greece, and received both a polite and a Christian education. It is generally supposed that the account of the persecutions at Lyons was written by himself. He succeeded the martyr Potinus as bishop of Lyons, and ruled his diocese with great propriety. He was a zealous opposer of heresies in general, and about Anno Domini 187 he wrote a celebrated tract against heresy. Victor, the bishop of Rome, wanting to impose the keeping of Easter there in preference to other places, it occasioned some disorders among the Christians. In particular, Irenaeus wrote him a synodical epistle in the name of the Gallic churches. This zeal in favor of Christianity pointed him out as an object of resentment to the emperor, and in Anno Domini 202 he was beheaded. The persecutions now extending to Africa, many were martyred in that quarter of the globe, the most particular of whom we shall mention. Perpetua, a married lady of about twenty-two years. Those who suffered with her were Felicitas, a married lady, big with child at the time of her being apprehended, and Revocatus, catechumen of Carthage and a slave. The names of the other prisoners, destined to suffer upon this occasion, were Saturninus, Secundulus, and Satur. On the day appointed for their execution, they were led to the amphitheatre, Sator, Saturninus, and Revocatus were ordered to run the gauntlet between the hunters, or such as had the care of the wild beasts. The hunters being drawn up in two ranks, they ran between, and were severely lashed as they passed. Felicitas and Perpetua were stripped, in order to be thrown to a mad bull, which made his first attack upon Perpetua and stunned her. He then darted at Felicitas, and gored her dreadfully, but not killing them. The executioner did that office with a sword. Revocatus and Satur were destroyed by wild beasts. Saturninus was beheaded, and Secundulus died in prison. 
These executions were in the 205, on the 8th day of March. Speratus and twelve others were likewise beheaded, as was Andocles in France. Asclepiades, bishop of Antioch, suffered many tortures, but his life was spared. Cecilia, a young lady of good family in Rome, was married to a gentleman named Valerian. She converted her husband and brother, who were beheaded, and the Maximus, or officer, who led them to execution, becoming their convert, suffered the same fate. The lady was placed naked in a scalding bath, and having continued there a considerable time, her head was struck off with a sword. Anno Domini 222. Callistus, bishop of Rome, was martyred, Anno Domini 224, but the manner of his death is not recorded, and Urban, bishop of Rome, met the same fate, Anno Domini 232. The sixth persecution, under Maximus, Anno Domini 235. Anno Domini 235 was in the time of Maximinus. In Cappadocia, the president, Ceremianus, did all he could to exterminate the Christians from that province. The principal persons who perished under his reign were Pontianus, bishop of Rome, and Teros, a Grecian, his successor, who gave offence to the government by collecting the acts of the martyrs. Pamachius and Quiritus, Roman senators, with all their families, and many other Christians, Simplicius, senator, Calipodius, a Christian minister, thrown into the Tiber, Martina, a noble and beautiful virgin, and Hippolytus, a Christian prelate, tied to a wild horse and dragged until he expired. During this persecution raised by Maximinus, numberless Christians were slain without trial, and buried indiscriminately in heaps, sometimes fifty or sixty, being cast into a pit together, without the least decency. The tyrant Maximinus dying, Anno Domini 238, was succeeded by Gordian, during whose reign, and that of his successor Philip, the church was free from persecution for the space of more than ten years. But in Anno Domini 249, a violent persecution broke out in Alexandria, at the instigation of a pagan priest, without the knowledge of the emperor. The seventh persecution, under Decius, Anno Domini 249. This was occasioned partly by the hatred he bore to his predecessor Philip, who was deemed a Christian, and was partly by his jealousy concerning the amazing increase of Christianity, for the heathen temples began to be forsaken, and the Christian churches thronged. These reasons stimulated Decius to attempt the very extirpation of the name of Christian, and it was unfortunate for the gospel that many errors had, about this time, crept into the church. The Christians were at variance with each other. Self-interest divided those whom social love ought to have united, and the virulence of pride occasioned a variety of factions. The heathens in general were ambitious to enforce the imperial decrees upon this occasion, and looked upon the murder of a Christian as a merit to themselves. The martyrs upon this occasion were innumerable, but the principle we shall give some account of. Fabian, the bishop of Rome, was the first person of eminence who felt the severity of this persecution. The deceased emperor Philip had, on account of his integrity, committed his treasure to the care of this good man. But Decius, not finding as much as his avarice made him expect, determined to wreak his vengeance on the good prelate. He was accordingly seized, and on January the 20th, Anno Domini 250, he suffered decapitation. Julian, a native of Scilicia, as we are informed by St. Chrysostom, was seized upon for being a Christian. He was put into a leather bag, together with a number of serpents and scorpions, and in that condition thrown into the sea. Peter, a young man, amiable for the superior qualities of his body and mind, was beheaded for refusing to sacrifice to Venus. He said, I am astonished you should sacrifice to an infamous woman, whose debaucheries even your own historians record, and whose life consisted of such actions as your laws would punish. No, I shall offer the true God the acceptable sacrifice of praises and prayers. 
Optimus, the proconsul of Asia, on hearing this, ordered the prisoner to be stretched upon a wheel, by which all his bones were broken, and then he was sent to be beheaded. Nihomahus, being brought before the proconsul as a Christian, was ordered to sacrifice to the pagan idols. Nihomahus replied, I cannot pay that respect to devils, which is only due to the Almighty. This speech so much enraged the proconsul that Nicomachus was put to the rack. After enduring the torments for a time, he recanted, but scarcely had he given this proof of his frailty than he fell into the greatest agonies, dropped down on the ground, and expired immediately. Denisa, a young woman of only sixteen years of age, who beheld this terrible judgment, suddenly exclaimed, O oh, unhappy wretch! Why would you buy a moment's ease at the expense of a miserable eternity? Optimus, hearing this, called her, and Denisa avowing herself to be a Christian, she was beheaded by his order soon after. Andrew and Paul, two companions of Nicomachus, the martyr, Anno Domini 251, suffered martyrdom by stoning, and expired, calling on their blessed Redeemer. Alexander and Epimachus of Alexandria were apprehended for being Christians, and confessing the accusation, were beat with staves, torn with hooks, and at length burned in the fire, and we are informed, in a fragment preserved by Oesobius, that four female martyrs suffered on the same day, and at the same place, but not in the same manner, for these were beheaded. Lucian and Marcion, two wicked pagans, those skilful magicians, becoming converts to Christianity, to make amends for their former errors, lived the lives of hermits, and subsisted upon bread and water only. After some time spent in this manner, they became zealous preachers, and made many converts. The persecution, however, raging at this time, they were seized upon and carried before Sabinus, the governor of Bithynia. On being asked by what authority they took upon themselves to preach, Lucian answered, that the laws of charity and humanity obliged all men to endeavor the conversion of their neighbors, and to do everything in their power to rescue them from the snares of the devil. Lucian having answered in this manner, Marcion said, Their conversion was by the same grace which was given to St. Paul, who, from a zealous persecutor of the church, became a preacher of the gospel. The proconsul, finding that he could not prevail with them to renounce their faith, condemned them to be burned alive, which sentence was soon after executed. Trifo and Respicius, two eminent men, were seized as Christians and imprisoned at Niki. Their feet were pierced with nails, they were dragged through the streets, scourged, torn with iron hooks, scorched with lighted torches, and at length beheaded, February the 1st, Anno Domini, 251. Agatha, a Sicilian lady, was not more remarkable for her personal and acquired endowments than her piety. Her beauty was such that Quintinian, governor of Sicily, became enamoured of her, and made many attempts upon her chastity without success. In order to gratify his passions with the greater conveniency, he put the virtuous lady into the hands of Aphrodica, a very infamous and licentious woman. This wretch tried every artifice to win her to the desired prostitution, but found all her efforts were vain, for her chastity was impregnable, and she well knew that virtue alone could procure true happiness. Aphrodica acquainted Quintian, with the inefficacy of her endeavours, who, enraged to be foiled in his designs, changed his lust into the resentment. On her confessing that she was a Christian, he determined to gratify his revenge, as he could not his passion. Pursuant to his orders, she was scourged, burnt with red-hot irons, and torn with sharp hooks. Having borne these torments with admirable fortitude, she was next laid naked upon live coals, intermingled with glass, and then being carried back to prison, she there expired on February the 5th, 251. Carol, bishop of Gortina, was seized by order of Lucius, the governor of that place, who nevertheless exhorted him to obey the imperial mandate, 
perform the sacrifices, and save his venerable person from destruction, for he was now eighty-four years of age. The good prelate replied that as he had long taught others to save their souls, he should only think now of his own salvation. The worthy prelate heard his fiery sentence without emotion, walked cheerfully to the place of execution, and underwent his martyrdom with great fortitude. The persecution raged in no place more than the island of Crete, for the governor, being exceedingly active in executing the imperial decrees, that place streamed with pious blood. Babylas, a Christian of a liberal education, became bishop of Antioch, Anno Domini 237, on the demise of the Binus. He acted with inimitable zeal, and governed the church with admirable prudence, during the most tempestuous times. The first misfortune that happened to Antioch during his mission was the siege of Ed by Sapor, king of Persia, who, having overrun all Syria, took and plundered this city, among others, and used the Christian inhabitants with greater severity than the rest, but was soon totally defeated by Gordian. After Gordian's death, in the reign of Decius, that emperor came to Antioch, where, having a desire to visit an assembly of Christians, Babylus opposed him, and absolutely refused to let him come in. The emperor dissembled his anger at that time, but soon, sending for the bishop, he sharply reproved him for his insolence, and then ordered him to sacrifice to the pagan deities as an expiation for his offence. This being refused, he was committed to prison, loaded with chains, treated with great severities, and then beheaded, together with three young men, who had been his pupils. Anno Domini 251 Alexander, bishop of Jerusalem, about this time, was cast into prison on account of his religion, where he died through the severity of his confinement. Julianus, an old man, lame with the goat, and Cronion, another Christian, were bound on the backs of camels, severely scourged, and then thrown into a fire and consumed. Also forty virgins at Antioch, after being imprisoned and scourged, were burned. In the year of our Lord 251, the Emperor Decius, having erected a pagan temple at Ephesus, he commanded all who were in that city to sacrifice to the idols. This order was nobly refused by seven of his own soldiers, Maximinianus, Martianus, Joannes, Malchus, Dionysius, Serion, and Constantinus. The Emperor, wishing to win these soldiers to renounce their faith by his entreaties and lenity, gave them a considerable respite, until he returned from an expedition. During the emperor's absence, they escaped, and hid themselves in a cavern, which the emperor being informed of at his return, the mouth of the cave was closed up, and they all perished with hunger. Theodora, a beautiful young lady of Antioch, on refusing to sacrifice to the Roman idols, was condemned to the stews, that her virtue might be sacrificed to the brutality of lust. Didymus, a Christian, disguised himself in the habit of a Roman soldier, went to the house, informed Theodora who he was, and advised her to make her escape in his clothes. This being effected, and a man found in the brothel instead of a beautiful lady, Didymus was taken before the president, to whom, confessing the truth, and owning that he was a Christian, the sentence of death was immediately pronounced against him. Theodora, hearing that her deliverer was likely to suffer, came to the judge, threw herself at his feet, and begged that the sentence might fall on her as the guilty person. But deaf to the cries of the innocent, and insensible to the cause of justice, the inflexible judge condemned both, when they were executed accordingly, being first beheaded, and their bodies afterwards burned. Secundianus, having been accused as a Christian, was conveyed to prison by some soldiers. On the way, Varianus and Marcellinus said, Where are you carrying the innocent? This interrogatory occasioned them to be seized, and all three, after having been tortured, were hanged and decapitated. Origen, the celebrated presbyter and catechist of Alexandria, at the age of sixty-four, was seized, thrown into a loathsome prison, laden with fetters, his feet placed in the stocks, 
and his legs extended to the utmost for several successive days. He was threatened with fire, and tormented by every lingering means the most infernal imaginations could suggest. During this cruel temporizing, the emperor Decius died, and Gallus, who succeeded him, engaging in a war with the Goths, the Christians met with a respite. In this interim, Oregon obtained his enlargement, and retiring to Tyre, he there remained until his death, which happened when he was in the sixty-ninth year of his age. Gallus, the emperor, having concluded his wars, a plague broke out in the empire. Sacrifices to the pagan deities were ordered by the emperor, and persecutions spread from the interior to the extreme parts of the empire, and many fell martyrs to the impetuosity of the rabble, as well as the prejudice of the magistrates. Among these were Cornelius, the Christian bishop of Rome, and Lucius, his successor, in 253. Most of the errors which crept into the church at this time arose from placing human reason in competition with revelation, but the fallacy of such arguments being proved by the most able divines, the opinions they had created vanished, away like the stars before the sun. End of chapter 2, part 2 Chapter 2, Part 3 of Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume 1 by John Fox. Edited by William Byron Forbush. Chapter 2 The Ten Primitive Persecutions, Part 3. The Eighth Persecution, under Valerian, Anno Domini 257 Began under Valerian, in the month of April, 257, and continued for three years and six months. The martyrs that fell in this persecution were innumerable, and their tortures and deaths as various and painful. The most eminent martyrs were the following, though neither rank, sex, nor age were regarded. Rufina and Secunda were two beautiful and accomplished ladies, daughters of Asterius, a gentleman of eminence in Rome. Rufina, the elder, was designed in marriage for Armentarius, a young nobleman. Secunda, the younger, for Verinus, a person of rank and opulence. The suitors, at the time of the persecutions commencing, were both Christians, but when danger appeared to save their fortunes, they renounced their faith. They took great pains to persuade the ladies to do the same. But disappointed in their purpose, the lovers were base enough to inform against the ladies, who, being apprehended as Christians, were brought before Junius Donatus, governor of Rome, where Anno Domini 257 they sealed their martyrdom with their blood. Stephen, bishop of Rome, was beheaded in the same year, and about that time Saturninus, the pious orthodox bishop of Toulouse, refusing to sacrifice to idols, was treated with all the barbarous indignities imaginable, and fastened by the feet to the tail of a bull. Upon a signal given, the enraged animal was driven down the steps of the temple, by which the worthy martyr's brains were dashed out. Sextus succeeded Stephen, a bishop of Rome. He is supposed to have been a Greek by birth, or by extraction and had for some time served in the capacity of a diacon under Stephen. His great fidelity, singular wisdom, and uncommon courage distinguished him upon many occasions, and the happy conclusion of a controversy with some heretics is generally ascribed to his pity and prudence. In the year 258, Marcianus, who had the management of the Roman government, procured an order from the emperor Valerian, to put to death all the Christian clergy in Rome, and hence the bishop with six of his deacons suffered martyrdom in 258. Let us draw near to the fire of martyred Lawrence, that our cold hearts may be warmed thereby. The merciless tyrant, understanding him to be not only a minister of the sacraments, but the distributor also of the church riches, promised to himself a double prey, 
by the apprehension of one soul. First, with the rake of avarice to scrape to himself the treasure of poor Christians. Then, with the fiery fork of tyranny, so to toss and turmoil them, that they should wax weary of their profession. With furious face and cruel countenance, the greedy wolf demanded where this Lawrence had bestowed the substance of the church, who, craving three days' respite, promised to declare where the treasure might be had. In the meantime, he caused a good number of poor Christians to be congregated. So when the day of his answer was come, the persecutor strictly charged him to stand to his promise. Then valiant Lawrence, stretching out his arms over the poor, said, These are the precious treasure of the church. These are the treasure indeed, in whom the face of Christ trineth, in whom Jesus Christ has his mansion place. What more precious jewels can Christ have than those in whom he has promised to dwell? For so it is written, I was unhungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. And again, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. What great riches can Christ our Master possess than the poor people in whom he loveth to be seen? Oh, what tongue is able to express the fury and madness of the tyrant's heart? Now he stamped, he stared, he ramped, he fared as one out of his wits. His eyes like fire glowed, his mouth like a boar formed, his teeth like a hellhound grinned. Now not a reasonable man, but a roaring lion he might be called. Kindle the fire, he cried, of wood make no spare. Has this villain deluded the emperor? Away with him, away with him. Whip him with scourges, jerk him with rods, buffet him with fists, brain him with clubs. Just as the traitor with the emperor, pinch him with fury tongues, gird him with burning plates, bring out the strongest chains and the fire forks, and the grated bed of iron, on the fire with it, bend the rebel hand and foot, and when the bed is fire hot, on with him, roast him, broil him, toss him, turn him, on pain of our high displeasure, do every man his office, O ye tormentors. The word was no sooner spoken, but all was done. After many cruel handlings, this meek lamb was laid, I will not say, on his fiery bed of iron, but on his soft bed of down. So mightily God wrought with his martyr Lawrence, so miraculously God tempered his element the fire, that it became not a bed of consuming pain, but a pallet of nourishing rest. In Africa the persecution raged with peculiar violence. Many thousands received the crown of martyrdom, among whom the following were the most distinguished characters. Cyprian, bishop of Carthage, an eminent prelate, and a pious ornament of the church. The brightness of his genius was tempered by the solidity of his judgment, and with all the accomplishments of the gentleman, he blended the virtues of a Christian. His doctrines were orthodox and pure, his language easy and elegant, and his manners graceful and winning. In fine, he was both the pious and polite preacher. In his youth he was educated in the principles of gentilism, and having a considerable fortune, he lived in a very extravagance of splendor, and all the dignity of pomp. About the year 246, Poecilius, a Christian minister of Carthage, became the happy instrument of Cyprian's conversion, on which account, and for the great love that he always afterward bore for the author of this conversion, he was termed Coecilius Cyprian. Previous to his baptism, he studied the scriptures with care, and being struck with the beauties of the truths they contained, he determined to practice the virtues therein recommended. Subsequent to his baptism, he sold his estate, distributed the money among the poor, dressed himself in plain attire, and commenced a life of austerity. He was soon after made a presbyter, and being greatly admired for his virtues and works, on the death of Donatus in Anno Domini 248, he was almost unanimously elected Bishop of Carthage. Cyprian's care not only extended over Carthage, but to Numidia and Mauritania. In all his transactions he took great care to ask the advice of his clergy, knowing that unanimity alone could be of the service to the Church, 
this being one of his maxims, that the bishop was in the church and the church in the bishop, so that unity can only be preserved by a close connection between the pastor and his flock. In Anno Domini 250, Cyprian was publicly proscribed by the Emperor Decius, under the appellation of Coecilius Cyprian, Bishop of the Christians, and the universal cry of the pagans was, Cyprian to the lions, Cyprian to the beasts. The bishop, however, withdrew from the rage of the populace, and his effects were immediately confiscated. During his retirement he wrote thirty pious and elegant letters to his flock, but several schisms that then crept into the church gave him great uneasiness. The rigor of the persecution abating, he returned to Carthage, and did everything in his power to expunge erroneous opinions. A terrible plague breaking out in Carthage, it was as usual laid to the charge of the Christians, and the magistrates began to persecute accordingly, which occasioned an epistle from them to Cyprian, in answer to which he vindicates the cause of Christianity. On two hundred fifty seven, Cyprian was brought before the proconsul Aspasius Paturnus, who exiled him to a little city on the Libyan Sea. On the death of this proconsul, he returned to Carthage, but was soon after seized and carried before the new governor, who condemned him to be beheaded, which sentence was executed on the 14th of September, Anno Domini 258. The disciples of Cyprian, martyred in this persecution, were Lucius, Flavian, Victoricus, Remus, Montanus, Julian, Primelus, and Donation. At Utica, a most terrible tragedy was exhibited. Three hundred Christians were, by the orders of the proconsul, placed round a burning lime kiln. A pan of coals and incense being prepared, they were commanded to either to sacrifice to Jupiter or to be thrown into the kiln. Unanimously refusing, they bravely jumped into the pit and were immediately suffocated. Fructosus, bishop of Tarragon in Spain, and his two deacons, Augurius and Eulogius, were burned for being Christians. Alexander, Malchus, and Priscus, three Christians of Palestine, with a woman of the same place, voluntarily accused themselves of being Christians, on which account they were sentenced to be devoured by tigers, which sentence was executed accordingly. Maxima, Donatilla, and Secunda, three virgins of Tuburga, had gall and vinegar given them to drink, were then severely scourged, tormented on a gibbet, rubbed with lime, scorched on a gridiron, worried by wild beasts, and at length beheaded. It is here proper to take notice of the singular but miserable fate of the Emperor Valerian, who had so long and so terribly persecuted the Christians. This tyrant, by a stratagem, was taken prisoner by Sapor, emperor of Persia, who carried him into his own country, and there treated him with the utmost unexampled indignity, making him kneel down as the meanest slave, and treading upon him as a footstool, when he mounted his horse. After having kept him for the space of seven years in this abject state of slavery, he caused his eyes to be put out, though he was then eighty-three years of age. This not satiating his desire of revenge, he soon after ordered his body to be flayed alive, and rubbed with salt, under which torments he expired, and thus fell one of the most tyrannical emperors of Rome, and one of the greatest persecutors of the Christians. Anno Domini 260, Gallienus, the son of Valerian, succeeded him, and during his reign, a few martyrs accepted, the church enjoyed peace for some years. The Ninth Persecution under Aurelian, Anno Domini 274 The principal sufferers were Felix, Bishop of Rome. This prelate was advanced to the Roman seat in 274. He was the first martyr to Aurelian's petulancy, being beheaded on the 22nd of December in the same year. Agapetus, a young gentleman, who sold his estate, and gave the money to the poor, was seized as a Christian, tortured, and then beheaded at Praeneste, a city within a day's journey of Rome. These are the only martyrs left upon record during this reign, 
as it was soon put to a stop by the emperor's being murdered by his own domestics at Byzantium. Aurelian was succeeded by Tacitus, who was followed by Probus, as the latter was by Carus. This emperor being killed by a thunderstorm, his sons, Carnius and Numerian, succeeded him, and during all these reigns the church had peace. Diocletian mounted the imperial throne anno domini 284. At first he showed great favor to the Christians. In the year 286 he associated Maximian with him in the empire, and some Christians were put to death before any general persecution broke out. Among these were Felician and Primus, two brothers. Marcus and Marcellinius were twins, natives of Rome and of noble descent. Their parents were heathens, but the tutors, to whom the education of the children was entrusted, brought them up as Christians. Their constancy at length subdued those who wished them to become pagans, and their parents and whole family became converts to a faith they had before reprobated. They were martyred by being tied to posts, and having their feet pierced with nails. After remaining in this situation for a day and a night, their sufferings were put an end to by thrusting lances through their bodies. Zoe, the wife of the jailer, who had the care of the before-mentioned martyrs, was also converted by them, and hung upon a tree, with a fire of straw lighted under her. When her body was taken down, it was thrown into a river, with a large stone tied to it, in order to sink it. In the year of Christ, 286, a most remarkable affair occurred. A legion of soldiers, consisting of 6,666 men, contained none but Christians. This legion was called the Theban Legion, because the men had been raised in Thebes. They were quartered in the east, until the Emperor Maximian ordered them to march to Gaul, to assist him against the rebels of Burgundy. They passed the Alps into Gaul, under the command of Mauritius, Candidus, and Exupernis, their worthy commanders, and at length joined the emperor. Maximian, about this time, ordered a general sacrifice, at which the whole army was to assist, and likewise he commanded that they should take the oath of allegiance and swear, at the same time, to assist in the extirpation of Christianity in Gaul. Alarmed at these orders, each individual of the Theban legion absolutely refused either to sacrifice or take the oath be prescribed. This so greatly enraged Maximian, that he ordered the legion to be decimated, that is, every tenth man to be selected from the rest, and put to the sword. This bloody order having been put in execution, those who remained alive were still inflexible. When a second decimation took place, and every tenth man of those living was put to death. This second severity made no more impression than the first had done. The soldiers preserved their fortitude and their principles, but by the advice of their officers, they drew up a loyal remonstrance to the emperor. This, it might have been presumed, would have softened the emperor, but it had a contrary effect, for, enraged at their perseverance and unanimity, he commanded that the whole legion should be put to death, which was accordingly executed by the other troops, who cut them to pieces with their swords, September 22, 286. Alban, from whom St. Albans, in Hertfordshire, received its name, was the first British martyr. Great Britain had received the gospel of Christ from Lucius, the first Christian king, but did not suffer from the rage of persecution for many years after. He was originally a pagan, but converted by a Christian ecclesiastic named Amphibalus, whom he sheltered on account of his religion. The enemies of Amphibalus, having intelligence of the place where he was secreted, came to the house of Alban, in order to facilitate his escape. When the soldiers came, he offered himself up as the person they were seeking for. The deceit being detected, the governor ordered him to be scorched, and then he was sentenced to be beheaded, June the 22nd, Anno Domini 287. The Venerable Bede assures us that upon this occasion the executioner suddenly became a convert to Christianity, and entreated permission to die for Alban, or with him. Obtaining the latter request, 
they were beheaded by a soldier, who voluntarily undertook the task of executioner. This happened on the 22nd of June, Anno Domini 287, at Verulam, now St. Albans, in Herefordshire, where a magnificent church was erected to his memory about the time of Constantine the Great. The edifice, being destroyed in the Saxon Wars, was rebuilt by Offa, king of Mercia, and a monastery erected adjoining to it, some remains of which are still visible, and the church is a noble Gothic structure. Face, a Christian female of Aquitaine in France, was ordered to be broiled upon a gridiron, and then beheaded. Anno Domini 287. Quintin was a Christian and a native of Rome, but determined to attempt the propagation of the gospel in Gaul with one Lucian. They preached together in Amiens, after which Lucian went to Beaumaris, where he was martyred. Quintin remained in Picardy and was very zealous in his ministry. Being seized upon as a Christian, he was stretched with pulleys until his joints were dislocated. His body was then torn with wire scourges, and boiling oil and pitch poured on his naked flesh. Lighted tortures were applied to his sides and armpits, and after he had been thus tortured, he was remanded back to prison, and died of the barbarities he had suffered. 31st of October, Anno Domini 287 his body was sunk in the Somme. The Tenth Persecution under Diocletian, Anno Domini 303 Under the Roman emperors, commonly called the Era of the Martyrs, was occasioned partly by the increasing number and luxury of the Christians, and the hatred of Galerius, the adopted son of Diocletian, who, being stimulated by his mother, a bigoted pagan, never ceased persuading the emperor, to enter upon the persecution, until he had accomplished his purpose. The fatal day fixed upon to commence the bloody work was the 23rd of February, Anno Domini 303, that being the day in which the Terminalia were celebrated, and on which, as the cruel pagans boasted, they hoped to put a termination to Christianity. On the appointed day, the persecution began in Nicomedia, on the morning of which, the prefect of that city repaired, with a great number of officers and assistants, to the church of the Christians, where, having forced open the doors, they seized upon all the sacred books, and committed them to the flames. The whole of this transaction was in the presence of Diocletian and Galerius, who, not contented with burning the books, had the church leveled with the ground. This was followed by a severe edict, commanding the destruction of all other Christian churches and books, and an order soon succeeded, to render Christians of all denominations outlaws. The publication of this edict occasioned an immediate martyrdom, for a bold Christian not only tore it down from the place to which it was affixed, but execrated the name of the emperor for his injustice. A provocation like this was sufficient to call down pagan vengeance upon his head, he was accordingly seized, severely tortured, and then burned alive. All the Christians were apprehended and imprisoned, and Galerius privately ordered the imperial palace to be set on fire, that the Christians might be charged as the incendiaries, and a plausible pretense given for carrying on the persecution with the greater severities. A general sacrifice was commenced, which occasioned various martyrdoms. No distinction was made of age or sex. The name of Christian was so obnoxious to the pagans that all indiscriminately fell sacrifices to their opinions. Many houses were set on fire, and whole Christian families perished in the flames, and others had stones fastened about their necks, and being tied together were driven into the sea. The persecution became general in all the Roman provinces, but more particularly in the east, and, as it lasted ten years, it is impossible to ascertain the numbers martyred, or to enumerate the various modes of martyrdom. Racks, scourges, swords, daggers, crosses, poison, and famine were made use of in various parts to dispatch the Christians, and invention was exhausted to devise tortures against such as had no crime, but sinking differently from the waters of superstition. A city of Phrygia, consisting entirely of Christians, was burned, 
and all the inhabitants perished in the flames. Tired with slaughter at length, several governors of provinces represented to the imperial court the impropriety of such conduct. Hence many were respited from execution, but though they were not put to death, as much as possible was done, to render their lives miserable, many of them having their ears cut off, their noses slit, their right eyes put out, their limbs rendered useless by dreadful dislocations, and their flesh seared in conspicuous places with red-hot irons. It is necessary now to particularize the most conspicuous persons who laid down their lives in martyrdom in this bloody persecution. Sebastian, a celebrated martyr, was born at Narbonne, in Gaul, instructed in the principles of Christianity at Milan, and afterward became an officer of the emperor's guard at Rome. He remained a true Christian in the midst of idolatry, unallured by the splendors of a court, untamed by evil examples, and uncontaminated by the hopes of preferment. Refusing to be a pagan, the emperor ordered him to be taken to a field near the city, termed the Campus Martius, and there to be shot to death with arrows, which sentence was executed accordingly. Some pious Christians coming to the place of execution, in order to give his body burial, perceived signs of life in him, and immediately moving him to a place of security, they, in a short time, effected his recovery, and prepared him for a second martyrdom. For as soon as he was able to go out, he placed himself intentionally in the emperor's way, as he was going to the temple, and reprehended him for his various cruelties and unreasonable prejudices against Christianity. As soon as Diocletian had overcome his surprise, he ordered Sebastian to be seized, and carried to a place near the palace, and beaten to death, and that the Christian should not either use means again to recover or bury his body, he ordered that it should be thrown into the common sewer. Nevertheless, a Christian lady named Lucina found means to remove it from the sewer, and bury it in the catacombs, or repositories of the dead. End of chapter 2, part 3